the program in brief is we're going to have a number of presentations after the opening uh, session. And after the, the presentations, there will be an opportunity for about 20 minutes where we can engage with the presenters. And there will be a, a short discussion, panel discussion, and, and we'll also have an opportunity for a question and answer session. Um, the moderator for today is going to be Olivia. Um, he's the coordinator for disaster risk financing and the insurance program with the World Bank. Um, he's going to assist me and we're going to take you through the process in, in, in quite a structured way. In opening, the Minister for Cooperative Governance yesterday made a statement that disaster management is everybody's business, and which includes the financial sector. Um, we, we heard a lot of presentations and discussions yesterday at the onset of the impact of weather-related issues and, and what the impact of disaster has on, on countries, on the economies, and, and how we deal with those. And today we want to speak a bit about how we get the, the, the partnerships going here with governments and with the financial sectors to try and mitigate some of the risks that are related to this business. I think without any further ado, let's, let's ask Olivia to, to take us through uh, a brief opening address, and then we will start with the prese presentations. Just to say that we have um, five presentations, and we'll introduce each of the presenters as we go ahead. Olivia, thanks. Thank you, Ken. I'll try to be brief, uh, given the... Uh, the high-level panel we have been able to, to, um, to invite today. Uh, just a com comment from the World Bank perspective. It's a very important uh, topic for us at the World Bank, disaster risk financing, particularly in the broader disaster risk management and the climate change adaptation agenda. And I think one of the key messages you're going you're gonna to hear today is that disaster risk financing is not a standalone activity. It's really a tool to assist uh, uh, decision makers and uh, uh, policymakers in uh, dealing with disaster, the impact of, uh, of natural disasters. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly exposed to natural disasters, uh, including drought and floods. And those two disasters uh, uh, impact, uh, on average, 80% of the loss of life, and about 70% of economic losses are related to drought and, uh, and floods in, uh, in, 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 in Africa. Uh, what do we mean by disaster risk financing? I will not answer the question now, but this is exactly what we're going to try to discuss in the next, uh, in the next, uh, in, in the next hour. Uh, this can be addressed at the macro level. It's an important topic for the Ministry of Finance to be able to mobilize funds when a disaster strikes and then help ultimately implementing agencies like the National Disaster Management Offices to quickly react and provide uh, uh, support and, uh, uh, and to, accept, to, uh, to, uh, to help the, uh, the needed people. Uh, this can also be seen at the micro level with the help of the insurance uh, industry and uh, this uh, insurance industry is quite active in South Africa and how the insurance industry and the private insurance industry can also support uh, the, uh, the long-term reconstruction of, uh, of the impact of natural disasters. Um, overall, uh, disaster risk information is critical. And particularly from the insurance perspective, this is a kind of lifeblood, if you wish. Without uh, good information, good quality information, it's very difficult to design any cost-effective solutions to deal with natural disasters. So it's very important to have a good understanding of the risks faced uh, in, in, in those countries. Now, as we're going to discuss in a few minutes, uh, Risk assessment also may, may mean many, many things. And financial risk assessment is one way to understand risks. And what we're going to discuss in this session is that for financial decision makers, the type of information that is needed may be slightly different from other types of information for uh, other, uh, uh, other policy makers. So it's also very important to try to identify the right, uh, the right information. The role of the World Bank here, in fact, and in fact in this broader agenda, is really to facilitate this, uh, this discussion. As you will see here, many countries, both in Africa and outside Africa, have been involved for some time on disaster risk financing. So our job is just to facilitate and to have a kind of open forum on uh, what disaster risk financing means and what are the limitations of disaster risk financing. The very last thing we want you to think is that this is the silver bullet to deal with natural disaster, for, with the disaster risk management. It's just one tool that can be, in some cases, very efficient to address some specific needs, but this is definitely not the ultimate solution when it comes to disaster risk, uh, disaster risk management. Uh, 
I'm going to stop here and again. I think it's a very nice opportunity today, based on the, on the presentations we're going to have in a few minutes, just to brainstorm together and to ask, I would say, naive, candid questions, and to be a bit provocative in, the, uh, in, in this session, again, to, um, to, to see and to discuss together what are the opportunities and challenges uh, for disaster risk financing in the context of Africa. So without further ado, I will pass the, the floor to Ken. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, we're going to start with the presentations. Our first presentation is a pr programmatic approach to f uh, fiscal disaster risk assessment and management. Marcus Schrader is the counselor for the Swiss Economic Co Corporation and Development in South Africa, and he's going to be leading us in the presentation. Marcus, you have the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody probably find yourself some chairs there, two here, one behind there, two other chairs, so there's ample space, just don't mind, and come from the back. If you want to stand all morning, you're welcome, of course, as well. Um, yeah, you've seen the title. We're short on time, so we just skip to the next one. Um, indeed, it's very important also from our perspective, from the Swiss Economic Corporation, to emphasize that um, risk financing is obviously not the one-size-fits-all solution uh, to disaster risk management. Um, this, for us, is one part in the puzzle, um, a very big one, um, which we're not going to talk, which I'm not going to talk about, is which basically comes either before or after that, um, which are measures of risk reduction um, or recovery, which make part of actually our um, Swiss, what we call humanitarian aid, and you would be talking there about. For instance, questions like construction codes, land zoning, emergency preparedness in terms of risk reduction, or in terms of recovery, you would be talking about emergency response, emergency relief, and reconstruction. That is not what I'm going to talk about. Um, but equally important, obviously, as much as many more topics which are discussed here. Um, as you see, our main goal, you see to your right, is a sustainable economic development and integration into the global economy. Now you say, what, what does this have to do with disaster? Well. Um, if you just look then on the left-hand side, which are our pillars how w where we're working in, you'll see that there is ample space actually um, for risk. And whenever you've got, whenever you're prone to risk, as one part of our activities, we're also looking into which kind of, of uh, risk finance, financing activities can we provide in order to mitigate these risks. Um, it is by far not the only instrument we have. Probably it is like 10% of our portfolio at maximum, which, which deals with this kind of activities and issues. But definitely it is an issue in all of these um, different pillars, which you see to your very right. So if you look at the sound financial infrastructure, if you're looking at a good business environment, affordable basic infrastructure, and trade policy promotion even there, we'll come to the examples a bit later. Um, also in terms of our um, partner countries, you, you've got there a few examples, obviously South Africa in terms of droughts and floods um, would add another example in here, um, shows you how actually our partner countries are, might be affected uh, by that. Um, what is quite interesting is um, um, if you're looking into that, um, that different countries may take different approaches to it, and rightfully so. I mean, um, disaster risk financing um, can't even on the, w on the level of financing just work with a one-size-fits-all approach because you actually have different countries with different capabilities. Um, as you may see here as an example, um, we are actually within the Swiss Economic Corporation working and focusing on middle-income countries with the aim to have them as an, as an economic hub for the region. If you're looking for middle-income countries, they're in a very very specific situation also when it comes to risk financing. If you look at the very Swiss example, I mean, we would probably uh, raise most of our funding, which we would need for that, uh, from issuing long-term fixed rate securities in our domestic market. We'll have access to wide range of liability management tools, swaps, buybacks, exchange, and we, are, we have quite some, some tools at hand to manage risks. Um, on the other end, if you're looking into more lower economic uh, economies, um, you have very limited choices in debt instruments and, and risk instruments, and you're often restricted to financial terms and currencies offered by, by B and multilateral lenders, 
obviously, if you don't get into risk financing at all, then afterwards on the recovery side, the international donor community uh, will, will, come, will have to come in and provide its part because you simply haven't got more choices. If you're a middle-income country, you're somewhat stretched and you're somewhere in between. Um, and obviously, it depends a bit on, on your stage of development, where you are and what you can do. Um, but actually, you may have some more um, opportunities here, and, and you may want to look into other options um, which are available. You also may have a basic enabling environment which you need, um, and there I'm talking about the institutional and the human capacity, but I'm also talking, and that is quite important, about the long-term vision. That's a bit similar to, to, to your debt management issues, um, where you probably need to take a longer horizon than, than just from one election to the next, which also means you need to have your political support in the country to go onto that long-term vision. And that is also why in some countries, uh, presumably um, disaster risk financing is regarded as a, as a medium to uh, high risk issue also from, from, from then uh, your financing institutions or your reinsurers, uh, whomever you have there, because you need to have this macroeconomic stability, otherwise you can't venture into these fields. Um, what is very important, and the examples show it very nicely here, um, and that can't be under uh, overemphasized, I'm sorry, even in, I mean, in terms of crisis also in Europe, that you have to look beyond the financial and economic crisis, where also all countries are prone to, but you have to look into your proneness to disasters, um, your changing patterns of climate change, and what that actually will, term will, will lead you to in, in terms of disaster, and you see how that can affect your GDP and obviously then the ec entire economy. In turn, if you think from the perspective of a development partner, when we are financing um, certain activities with our partner countries to, to look into certain of these issues, what happens actually with our money as, as from, from purely an investor's perspective if afterwards this country is so prone to certain disasters um, that 10 years down the line actually all your investment which you ventured into with your partner country actually was gone due to, to an unforeseen risk or something where you didn't look into. Therefore, the solution indeed is act before it hits. And um, therefore, you need to understand uh, the vulnerability and resilience as a contingent liability. And I think that is a very key point. Um, and that is something which is often overlooked. It's quite, quite obvious why for us. Um, because for, for us, the con this contingent liability is often implicit. And the law doesn't usually clearly define the financial responsibility of the get, uh, government due to the re disaster. Nevertheless, and that's what we're seeing all over the place, including Switzerland, we are not an ex exemption here, is um, you act as a financer, insurer, reinsurer of last resort anyway, because in the end, your citizens will turn back to government and say, look, somebody has to bail us out here. Um, we had some flooding, some drought recently, uh, what we had in Switzerland, uh, we, we had some rocks falling down on the railways, the railway lines are blocked, um, the transfer transport mechanisms from, from the German-speaking to the Italian-speaking parts, which is behind the Alps, is now blocked. An entire part of the population, that's at least 10%, um, now going to get into an uprising because the transport corridor is blocked. So what do you do as a government? You, you have to get step in there and you have to see. And you've got certain um, ex-ante and exposed instruments to finance natural disasters. In the aftermath of a disaster, you have, you have immediate expenditure and your needs are high. Um, immediately available financial resources are usually limited, creating a liquidity gap. And again, if you're then a lower income country or also an emerging market, at that moment of the crisis, if you want to go borrowing, obviously the market will ask you for higher rates. So if you act before it hits, um, you may actually may, may get in, venture into a cheap, cheaper solution here. Um, and obviously you also want to take a um, an approach which um, relies on an optimal combination of, of different mechanisms so that your risk insurance is not the only, only way of dealing with the matter. Finally, here on the, panel, uh, on, the, on the screen you see a few of the mechanisms we have currently at hand. Um, they reach from sovereign disaster risk financing over property catastrophe risk insurance and agriculture insurance. So you might see, well, that's quite diverse. And not all of this obviously talks to the public sector. Nevertheless, we find it quite interesting, and without going further into the details due to unfortunately time constraints, um, I'd nevertheless like to, to show you that there are linkages between all these. Um, 
For instance, I just have five bullets here. The macro level agricultural risk stress tests can be a building block for sovereign financial risk assessments. Your vulnerability, vulnerability sovereign ri financial risk assessments can be a building block for more detailed actuarial risk assessments for product pricing. The legal regulatory review of, ins of the insurance sector to is uh, there to support insurance penetration, enabling and enhancing the private sector products, for instance, pooling. Um, then you can have an, a scaling up of insurance products on the base of all this, for instance, weather risk or again pooling, to include governments, or you can scale down that uh, insurance product, um, for instance, pools, to include the agriculture supply chain. Finally, strengthening the um, risk management capacity, for instance, of agricultural supply chains, but also um, of the housing market, which you saw there, um, and the private sector in general, um, <coughs> reduces the contingent liability of governments. So even if you're looking into uh, supporting the private sector in that, obviously, your risk to be the reinsurer of last resort as a government gets more limited because basically the private sector can take over uh, some of the activities on its own. So that's in a very nutshell and very short what I have to do. I see the stop sign here and I stop there. In terms of qu questions, I'll sit on the pen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, our next presentation will deal with the developing uh, a sovereign disaster risk financing strategy in the context of disaster risk management, and we're going to be listening to a Mexican experience. Our presenter is Manuel Labato. He's the former head of insurance, pension, and social security in the Ministry of Finance in the Government of Mexico. Manuel, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, thanks to, to the bank um, for having me here. Thank you, all of you. Um, uh, l l let me talk to you. I, I want to um, start from what Marcus uh, said that I think is very interesting and very relevant, not only for uh, disaster risk management strategy, but from the, from the Ministry of Finance perspective, which is uh, act before it hits. I think that it sounds in our head, act before it hits. So it's very important. I think that um, uh, um, perhaps many of you do not remember, but in 1895, we have a very big quake. And it shakes us not only um, in the, from the physical point of view, from the, but from our uh, state of mind. You know, we, need, we needed to react. And that quake changed our, um, our view of uh, facing natural, natural disasters. Mexico, as um, many of uh, South Africa and many other countries represented here, it's a beautiful country. And it is a potential hub, you know, for trade and uh, for, for, for um, the rest of the Americas. But of course, uh, economists say that, that, that there is no f such thing as a free lunch. And we, have, we, are, we are facing several, um, several natural disasters. Um, let me tell you that uh, I I with that in mind, uh, by the, by uh, the mid-2000, let's say by 2006, Mexico had a a very significant, uh, very, had made some very significant improvements in terms of uh, uh, disaster risk financing. And what I want to say about disaster risk financing, it, it's, um, it's just the way we face from the financial point of view, uh, the fact that we need to, um, uh, someday we're going to wake up with a disaster out there. And you know, um, yesterday we were, uh, many presenters said that f disasters are just around the corner. They are increasing and the population exposed have been, had been increase, uh, increasing too. You know, uh, what do we do? We had, by, by, mid, uh, by mid 2000s, we have two main strategies for disaster risk financing. That is to cope with, with disaster from the financial point of view. One was the a budgetary vehicle, you know, the, the, the federal budget vehicle. It was, a, it was our funding. Funding was created in 96 and uh, to financial support, let, let's say, um, the disaster risk management. I think uh, that, that Ken uh, knows about it, and we had. Um, a financial arm for, for disaster risk management. And it facilitates in the sense that um, it is the, the budgetary vehicles that, um, uh, that provides uh, funding uh, to attend these, um, these events. Not only that, I think that Fonden plays a very important role as a, a, it, in economic terms in sense of it, it solves some coordination problems, not only at, in terms of operations, but in terms of the, the budgetary operations uh, uh, to finance uh, natural disasters. 
now we also had some uh, risk transfer uh, mechanisms. What were what were uh, there is that uh, we have some uh, some insurance policies. For example, for for uh, for um, hospitals, uh, for schools, and uh, for water infrastructure, but they were not so great. Uh, we had them; uh, they were working, but they not working at the at the best level. Also, in the international arena, in 2006, uh, the, the the Mexican government, the the Minister of Finance, we call Hacienda, and I think that that many people has heard that uh, name here, Hacienda, uh, placed. Um, uh, uh, and um, cat bond, we call it CADMEX, and it protected uh, the, the, the Mexican finances against uh, the earthquake uh, risk. Um, it was a coverage around uh, 450 million million dollars, and it covered a, a specific zone, the most exposed zones in Mexico. So let's say we have something just for, for an illustration like this. We have two pieces, large pieces, and uh, small pieces in the, in, the, in, in the part below. We have CADMEX and Fonden, of course, we was the budget. It was another way to call it the budget, you know? And uh, be, below was the insurance for schools, for water infrastructure, and for hospitals. But there was not a coherent uh, vision of it. There was no, um, there, is no where, there was not a clear direction we wanted to, to, to go in, in terms of disaster risk financing. Then, uh, we were lacking two main elements to develop uh, risk transfer mechanisms. What is important to, uh, to develop disaster, uh, disaster uh, risk transfer mechanisms? Um, the, the first thing is, I think that Marcus was saying, and the under, uh, underlying discussion of what he was saying, is that in the end, we need to diversify our sources of, our sources, you know, funding when a disaster hits. We need to act before it hits again, and uh, we need we need uh, several because anyway you may say well you know we have the government has a large a very large balance we can we can um, absorb any hit well that's in theory you know because you know you have a lot of uh, social programs and other uh, economic programs that you need to develop and it is all not, not only part of the economy but it's also a part of a, a government program. So you need to act, and you need to have the funding to react because you need to give the population a right answer in the right moment. So you need to have a lot of uh, funding um, sources to better cope with all of this when you most need it. I am not going to enter into the details of what are the advantages of it that, that Marcus quickly went uh, through it uh, in, in his presentation. Now, what, what are two, these two ma main elements? And you know, recently on John 16, uh, on John 16 um, uh, half, uh, 20 day, days ago, the World Bank and the government of Mexico presented a, a book uh, under the G20 umbrella. I think that this book is very important because these uh, books un help us to understand precisely this. Hacienda, with the, with the support of UNAM, UNAM is the largest public university in Mexico, and Agrocemex is the public insurance company, built up two key elements. What? An inventory of main assets covered by Fonden. Roads around um, 140,000 kilometers, around 7,000 bridges. Uh, hospitals, uh, around uh, uh, 15 hospitals. Uh, schools, around 2,100 schools. And, um, uh, and housing for, uh, for low-income people, uh, around 12 million uh, uh, dwelling units. You know, this is very important. What to cover? What we need to protect when a disaster hits? That is an inventory. What? And not only that, you know, later talking to the Vice Minister of Finance back then, I was, uh, I was telling him that he could use it to try to validate the expansion, um, the expansion programs of several assets. For example, do we need a hospital here? or do we need another school in this area? If we have, you know, because this inventory has location, replacement value, and the location is um, georeferenced. Uh, so we, we know exactly in terms of satellite, in terms of the globe, where is the school, and we have pictures of the schools. We have pictures uh, of every 10, uh, 100 meters of, of each road. So we also have this information to do some something, something else. And not only that, we had what to cover, but 
against what we're going to cover it, which is a modeling system for earthquake and hurricane risk. You know, uh, some, someone perhaps talking, or later we're going to talk about uh, in this conference, about flood risk that it is a very important for South Africa. You know, models are getting there in terms of uh, flood, and it is going to be something very important to cover in the future uh, for Mexico, because Mexico is also exposed uh, to flood. Um, that then is what to cover, against what to cover, and what are the results of not covering it. That is to say, what is the impact in, in financial terms of a when a disaster hits. That's very important because this helps help us to get a right insurance for our infrastructure. Later, um, I'm going to be quick now. Um, in, May, in October 2009, we're partnering with the World Bank and with a very big insurance and, and, and a investment bank, we, we placed a Multicat Mexico 2009. We are renewing Multicat this year. We are working with the World Bank let me tell you that it is multi because we have two perils covered, earthquake and hurricane, not only one as in our 2006 uh, um, cat bond. It, it is a parametric cat bond. I am not going to enter into the details, but if you go to the World Bank, there are many publications on, 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 this, um, on this particular instrument. Uh, and then later, uh, in 2010, we place what we call uh, excess of loss insurance. What is the excess of loss insurance is that you know, you have been hit by several, by several uh, events. So when we spend some money, then the insurance comes in. And the money from the insurers came to the Mexican government to help Mexican population. It is like when you hit a car, you know, you don't have enough money, you hit your car, the insurance comes and pays for the, for, for the reparation or the reparation of the other car. That is a, it's an insurance, uh, an excess of loss insurance, but in this, in this case, you know, you have to spend a minimum amount for the insurers to come to help you. Um, they, uh, the, the Mexican government just uh, renewed this uh, a few days ago while announcing um, this in the, the, the book, the, the G20 book that was uh, uh, co uh, co written by, by the, um, by, by the World Bank with Mexico. Just to wrap up, uh, we also have another strategy, you know, we've been working to ensure uh, and to protect storm pikes, which is not covered at the first loss level. Uh, we have uh, to, de to develop some uh, housing for low income population, and we need to go on in, in, into the uh, deepening this, um, this risk analysis that we have uh, made, and we also are partnering uh, with the local governments uh, to have a for they to have a risk transfer strategy. In the end, what we have is, is not this uh, block with, you know, without sense, but it's an order block. We want to know, we, wa we know now where we want to go and what are the steps uh, behind this and to reach this and after this. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank, uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Manuel. The next presentation is going to deal with public and private partnership for disaster risk assessment and financing, and we're going to have a South African experience. The presenter is Debbie Donaldson. She's the General Manager of Strategy and Planning at the South African Insurance Association. Debbie. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to share this experience. Um, as I talk through these four points that we're going to share um, uh, and, and the process that we started in November last year with the National Disaster Management Center, I just want to indicate that from a South African insurance point of view, we represent um, 59 uh, members all the way from a niche underwriter through to a reinsurer and a classic underwriter. And um, it was a natural um, relationship for us to engage with the National Disaster Management Center because if you look at um, the National Disaster Management Center's role in South Africa, essentially um, the triangle summarizes what they're seeking to achieve. And they bring together from a government point of view um, a stakeholder which essentially their key focus is about reducing systemic risk. And the reason we engaged right from the beginning was because we recognize that in 10 to 15 years from now, we are going to be operating in a different environment. And we require interventions to happen now in order to manage that outcome in the future.
And we needed to partner with someone who could bring us all the points of contact and the stakeholders within government, whether they be a functional um, department like the Department of Agriculture um, or the National Treasury, essentially that might be a functional area, but also they could bring together people who work on the ground in various levels of government to manage disaster. So local authorities, provincial or regional authorities, and national authorities and frameworks. From an insurance perspective, we really wanted to bring into that process um, our risk mitigation um, behaviours and ways of doing things. Because ultimately when we come into an environment, we bring that behavioural change and we really wanted to couple with people who want to bring about behavioural change, not just put in 17 fire engines because you have a risk uh, of fire in a particular area, but how do you go about changing behaviour on the ground? And we wanted to bring that to the party as well as bring alternative mechanisms for funding uh, risks that occur. So essentially, um, given the South African scenario, we also, amongst all of this in preparing for disasters for the future, we're also preparing for economic growth. And so the practices that we put in place for economic growth today affect our risks of the future. So it was important to bring that um, into the party. So we talk a lot of different things. We, we speak differently about risk, we use different terminology, but ultimately we share the common interests of citizens in our country. And we might service them differently, we might come to solutions differently, but we all land up in the same space. Um, the thing that really is in common is that we use the same frameworks to enact what we do. We use the same legal frameworks, the same disaster management frameworks to approach things. And so we need, really need to make sure that as we come together in this partnership, that those frameworks are enabling us to really play to our strengths um, in this process. Um, also, we need to recognize, we, we've recognized that um, you can't just look uh, at an insured and uninsured population uh, as clinically as, well, they are insured or they're uninsured. They live in an integrated environment. We live in an integrated environment. We're dependent on each other. So as the disaster occurs, essentially, if we don't look at that through a national, through a social economic lens, as opposed to just a financial loss, we miss an opportunity to recognize that if we don't uplift and spread insurance risk uh, further to people from a uh, recovery point of view. Essentially, people who can't recover become part of a different risk. <laughs> it might not be the disaster anymore, but they become part of a bigger risk. And that's a uh, volatile situation when you do live um, uh, in our environment. And so we can't stand by and say, well, we can't use other mechanisms to start thinking creatively about um, impacts on citizens in South Africa. We need to get our head around how we actually make solutions work um, effectively and together. So um, one of the things really has been a challenge in understanding our roles and responsibilities, being very clear that everybody has an equal stake in the outcome at the, and that they're very interlinked. So you can't ignore your partners, you can't ignore the community that you want to help. You actually need to find the voice of the community and there's many sessions in this, um, in this forum and uh, in this conference that um, we're hoping will also give us some insight to build into our thinking on this journey that we're taking. So essentially, we need to enable the leadership. It's pointless us putting in process a reactive response to something because right now it's uh, of a need. You know, maybe right now we need to educate a community. But if we just have that one single response, that doesn't mean it's sustainable or has longevity. So in engaging with the National Disaster Management Center, the, the South African Insurance um, Association has really relied on their ability to guide us in creating something that can come to a legal agreement together with our minister um, of cooperative governance, which essentially will be sustainable beyond the leadership that is negotiating that agreement today. How do we create structures and mechanisms together with our provinces, together with our local authority that's beyond the leadership of today? And it was spoke about earlier, beyond the political standing, because this is a citizen issue. Um, so essentially, in bringing together this memorandum of agreement and, and coming to agreement, we want that agreement to cover the entire risk management life cycle. We don't only want to be reactive. We need to build in prevention strategies now if we want to build resilient cities of the future. 
So we want to decrease the risk, decrease the systemic risk for everybody, and ultimately have a community impact. This, it's all pointless if we have this theoretical exercise without having a difference at a community level. And we want to do that through shared data and knowledge. And that's not a simple little um, ask. <laughs> Everybody's nervous about that. There's lots of challenges around that. And we need to do that through educating the role players and building the trust that is required when you go into a public-private partnership. It's not straightforward. And ultimately, increase the, the principles of insurance to actually get um, increased cover in the country and find other ways to, um, to uh, manage these uh, financial impacts. So you can have any kind of conceptual map. We can work on any model you like. You, could, you have many models of your own. But an important aspect of looking at a model is that you can see at a glance the relationship, the broader relationship, not just a one loss, but all of the activities that link systemically and converge, they have relationships to each other. So if you just look at the top, you start at the top of this diagram looking at large losses, and we say there's human impact, okay, just marked in red. In a loss, you have human impact, people lose jobs, you basically have material damage to the area. An example here would have been an example that happened in the Western Cape in 2009. We had a massive fire on the side of the mountain. So essentially, those losses is what we're ultimately, you know, we're looking at it from, a, from the risk perspective, not from the actual emergency service perspective. We take a look at it saying, drill down from the fire, from the, from the flood, from the um, uh, system, uh, um, uh, tremors, etc. Look at the risk at, from that perspective. Start there, and we can look at this multiple ways. But try to find a language which we can both speak, that at a glance you can speak to each other, no matter if I'm the CEO of an insurance company or the head of finance uh, or the minister of finance. I need to be able to look at this and say, what are we actually talking about? So you look at the large losses, you then look at the vulnerabilities that are attached to that. And it could be, in the case of this fire, it was a lack of adherence to regulation. Someone just chucked their cigarette out. They're on holiday, they chucked their cigarette out the window. Um, they, uh, th uh, th given the seasonality of the situation and the knowledge and skills, um, we had to respond to that major disaster. Uh, and so these things have different relationships. I mean, this example might not be perfect in its purest view, but it gives you a sense of how they interconnect. Ultimately, um, given the situation in, um, in, the, uh, in South Africa, we have a natural environment and we need to preserve it. It's one of our assets as well as the disaster, <laughs> as the, the physical assets. So the state of our ecosystems and what we're doing um, with our ecosystems does drive up the losses. And how are we building that into our thinking? And ultimately then, the mitigation may be around town planning, it may be around land use, it may be around management functions, but it, not, it won't necessarily just be about the financial instrument that we're using at the time. So I um, really want to implore upon you that this journey for us has been um, a very interesting one. It started at COP17, um, when the South African Insurance Association was invited by the World Bank to participate in that process in looking at alternative risk financing, and I thank you for that. I think it spurred a lot of our thinking um, in, in our approach. We then had a strategic think tank in March of this year, where we brought together the stakeholders that came through the National uh, Disaster Management Centre, and they've coordinated all these stakeholders within government to have a discussion about is this worthwhile? Or do we have the appetite actually? Because don't start this if you don't have the appetite because this is not an easy <laughs> trip. <laughs> this is a complex, you have to have resilience around this trip and you must be committed. The people in the negotiation better be committed to coming out the other end because this is not simple and easy. It's not everything. And so we had the think tank in March and we decided we do want to collaborate. We do need to do something effectively together and we can learn from each other. We can get past the problems. So um, essentially this is part of our journey in learning and in sharing in the experiences that you bring to the party. And we want a memorandum of agreement by the end of December ideally. And we want those strategic think tanks, those design think tanks that look at the systemic risk to really say, okay, looking at the systemic risk and the diagram I showed you earlier, if these factors, if there's a lot of convergence around one particular issue, then let's go for an intervention in that particular issue because it can have a multiple impact as opposed to trying to react uh, daily. So thank you for your time um, and thanks for the sign. Thanks. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, our next presentation is going to be looking at the Malawi experience with disaster risk management and financing for agriculture. 
Uh, Dice Kachingwe is, the risk manage, uh, is in the risk management unit in the Malawi Ministry of Agriculture. So, Dice, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be taking you through this presentation, and the, basically the objective of this presentation is to share with you experience uh, with disaster risk management uh, and financing for agriculture. Um, our definition of risk in this context is that uh, of uh, where a disaster happens in terms of, for example, a severe drought, uh, which in turn uh, affect a production of maize. So we are looking at a macro level uh, derivative program that has focused on government exposure at a macro level. And the target crop in this program is maize and then the technical work for the program began as, as, as late as, uh, as early as 2004 when uh, government came up with a comprehensive framework uh, to make sure that uh, we ad address the issues of food security in a comprehensive manner using market-based tools. Uh, the Basically, the starting point is, was motivated by the drought that happened in 2004, where the country suffered in, uh, huge uh, food, food uh, shortfalls. Um, the objective of the program has been to improve disaster risk um, assessment and error warning tools to identify contingent sources of financing that can be used to support responses, uh, strengthen government risk management capacity, that is to prepare government to integrate uh, market-based solutions into its own plans and to work with market independently. And then number four is to prevent, I mean to improve planning and budgeting uh, for national disasters. Now, uh, before I take you into the co actual contract structure, I, I thought I should expound really on the, the program itself. So it's a kind of program where we are ensuring the national maize crop uh, against severe drought. And I, I want you to underscore the word severe drought um, on the understanding that imports or food imports have tend to be costly, and the country is very much interested to strike a balance between achieving exports as well as food security for the people, as most of you are aware in this room that uh, staple foods tend to be very politically sensitive, and in fact, in other countries, they have even collapsed the governments. If people do not have food, uh, you, bet, you better take care as a politician. Uh, now, in terms of the contract structure, that's basically the design. I may not take you in the nitty gritties, maybe during the discussion time you might be asking the questions, but we, as government, I want you to focus on the down box where we have structured the arrangements of the contract. So here is gov government of Malawi, uh, through World Bank as, a, as brokers, uh, we pay a premium to a market counterpart. In this, in this case, it's Swiss Re. Of course, government of Malawi also has an obligation to supply weather data uh, through a data cleaner. So that data from the sampled weather stations is transmitted to a data cleaner who then transmits that data to the market counterpart, which is the insurance company. Swiss Re in this case. Now, the whole contract also is governed by a model, uh, what we call the Malawi Maize Index Production Model. Uh, the model is basically has an index so where up 
a trigger has to be made. A tr a, an index that reflects uh, the water requirement satisfaction for crop, in this case, maize. So if rain has not come adequately, that means, I'm sure most of you here are the technicians and know this stuff well, it will it trigger a payout beyond a certain, uh, or at a certain trigger level. In this case, in our context, it's 90% nine, uh, uh, Malawi mass index uh, in units. In terms of the numbers, well, the type of contract is the, is the, is the put option and the premium is that much, 499,000, uh, basically 500,000 US dollars. Um, maximum payout is five million, okay, 4.4 4. 4 million. Payout per commodity index so it's, it's not like he, once you, you trigger a payout, then you, you access the whole lot. It's actually a per, a per commodity index. Um, basically here, I'm just trying to elaborate in terms of the payout. So that slanting line is, 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 is showing that it's, it's indeed a per, per, per unit index, I mean per unit uh, so from 90 as a trigger level, if you reach maybe 89 or, or 70, it, it, will grip, it will trigger different payouts as, as, as shown on the horizontal axis. Um, of course, that's the maximum payout as I said. And that's the trigger level. This is just an example of what, how we fared in 2011, 2012. Uh, when you look at the black line there, it's a horizontal straight black line, that's the basis, the, actually the, the historic average for about over 30 years. Now the red line is showing, okay, the assumption is that rain will come as usual, but suppose there is a severe drought and it, it has led to uh, shortfalls in production, then you see that red line but that red line has to go down beyond that 90 uh, Malawi maize index for, for us to trigger a payout. And what we saw in, in, in the last season, we just ended uh, in April, uh, I mean, yeah, just last April, is that we came closer to 90 and everyone was a bit excited thinking that we would pay a trigger. But now it was tricky, and then it started going out <laughs> like that, and uh, eventually lost. We didn't pay, uh, we didn't trigger a payout. By the way, it is it is done at the end of the season in April. So they, for each month, they they, they, they compute the the mass index. So you find in some months, maybe it could be 89. Uh, in some month it will be 91, but at the end of the day, the average has to be below 91. And uh, we were not lucky enough. So we didn't, <laughs> we didn't trigger it out. Uh, but let me be positive again that this uh, program, I think it's a comprehensive program, as I said, looking at different tools, uh, market-based tools, including warehouse receipts, including put options. So we are exploring all those, all those tools. And indeed, uh, I just forgot, uh, as early as 2005, Malawi managed to successfully uh, import mails through the use of one of these tools. I think it's a put option where you put contracts to, in, in the understanding that once maize becomes scarce and prices are volatile, you just access the maize within the market arrangements of, of, of co-option or put uh, option. So this is just a sketchy idea of how the program has run, but uh, I think it's a very useful program uh, and it's a still work in progress. And if done properly, uh, if we understand the risks that are involved, uh, 
understanding the subject matter, portraying it well and communicating it well to the policy makers, politicians, it is workable. Uh, because the advantage is that once a payout is triggered, you don't, it's, it's timely. Within a short time, you access the funds and you, 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 you buy the, the, the acquired commodity. So in terms of the next steps, um, at policy level, government, okay, okay, with concerns that, okay, why haven't we triggered a payout since the last consecutive uh, years? So it's, it's government is at a position where we are still considering whether to proceed with the program or consider other means or other tools. Uh, technically, we are reviewing the modeling approach. Where have we gone wrong? Maybe the sampling of weather stations or we need to put in other parameters that can improve the transaction strategy. At institutional level, government is considering taking advantage of funding and expertise from different areas to support this work. Uh, I think that's all I had for you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dais. The, the last presentation we're going to be listening to is on the African risk capacity. Our presenter is Neil Cole. He's the Chief Director with the African Economic Integration, and he's with the National Treasury of the South African Government. So, Neil, we are ready to listen to you. Okay, I, I promise I, I did submit the presentation. Um, so maybe while the presentation is, is, being, is being loaded, um, let me firstly thank Ken and Olivia uh, for the opportunity. We, we approached the forum um, because we believed that this facility was a facility um, that we wanted to use this opportunity to, to present um, to, to the forum. Um, it's a it's 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 a it's a pan-African facility, and um, I suppose that's part of the caveat um, that that I need to that I need to present to you. Um, I work for the National Treasury um, in South Africa. Um, I encountered this this facility as it was being debated at the African Union. Um, it was being debated um, in a forum of um, senior treasury officials and also, and also amongst, amongst finance ministers. And I suppose the advantage of, of presenting at, at the very end is that there are several common principles that um, have run through all the, pre all, all the presentations and, and I certainly do not need to, to, to repeat them. Um, one of those um, principles is, is a principle that was shared by, by Marcus right at the beginning is that um, the way that we all know how disasters work, and in particular the way that disasters work in Africa, is that the event occurs. Um, we then assess, we then go out and appeal, we find the funding, and then we respond. Um, and, and in particular, when it comes to, when it comes to drought, um, many um, of the kind of interventions that can be taken are delayed and, and, and in the case of drought, a lot of that then turns into famine and results in, in the loss of life. So a, a point that Mark has also made um, as, as a common principle that runs through many of these presentations is that many of us here, I'm sure, would like disasters or disaster response, or disaster assistance to work in the following way and that is that we take some preventive action before the event uh, takes place. Um, and, and, and in terms of the type of presentations that are, being that are being made, what we are saying is that let's do some risk modeling, let's look at the populations that are going to be effective, affected if a, an, an event occurs, 
um, and let's work on some cost estimation at least. Where I'm sitting in the National Treasury, we know that we can plan better when we have a better idea of the kind of money that we are going to have available to spend. Um, and in the business that I'm sure many of you are involved in, it's important to do contingency planning. Um, and, and you'll hear that this presentation uh, of this facility is also a lot about that contingency planning. Um, so have that preventive response um, put in place as an, as an ex-ante measure so that when the event happens, um, you already, you've made the assessment um, where there was an appeal necessary that has taken place and, and the funding will be, will be then made available much, much quicker. Um, so what is the OCK, uh, the African Risk Capacity? Um, this is a project of the African Union, as I said. Um, it has been designed and established as an African-owned facility. Um, it is essentially a financial entity that would provide participating African Union member states contingent funds for now in the case, in the case of a drought. Uh, but the modeling is continuing and, and there's um, further examination to see over time how this facility can also look into uh, covering other types of, of disasters. Um, so in concept, it is essentially a quick disbursing fund after drought enabling a more timely response, um, so addresses one of the important principles that has been identified. Um, it, 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 it is intended to reduce the management costs by pooling risks across regionally diverse weather systems, and we'll, we will look at um, some examples of, of how the cost is, is, is reduced by, by pooling. Um, which I suppose is um, how most insurances that we deal with, whether it is our comprehensive household insurance, our car insurance works, it works because of pooling. Um, and it works because in the pool you have a diverse grouping um, of clients, or in this case, a diverse grouping of, of countries. Um, so the intention is to lower the cost to governments of disaster relief and also um, the impact of, of the drought. And, and by doing so, the ARC intends to transfer resources and decision-making to African governments. And that's particularly important if you think of how many African governments deal with responses to drought is that they often have to turn, in most cases, to donors um, in, order to, in order to finance um, the measures that need to be taken once an event has, has occurred. And, and what this does is that it is, it is a premium that you pay. The payout is a payout that you as a government is entitled to. And the decisions that you take is based on a contingency plan that you have in place, but essentially you the owner of how that money is going to be, is going to be spent. And then very importantly, it shifts the risk away from vulnerable populations and their governments to the OCK, which is in this case better equipped to handle um, those kind of risks. Um, so on, on, on the cost efficiencies, um, if we look at the, the, the horizontal, the horizontal um, axis, um, 42, uh, the number 42 there represents a grouping of countries, probably I think around about 36 countries, and also more than one season of a country. Um, so the 42 is made up of a combination of countries and, and seasons. And then um, the, 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 um, the vertical axis is the estimated worst case drought response costs. Um, so what we, we see there as we add more countries and as we add uh, more seasons, the amount of cost efficiencies I increase. Um, so the blue indicates the cumulative worst case drought by country in a pool. So if every single country should act as an individual country, take out insurance, um, the cost of that is shown by the blue, by the blue line. Um, and then um, this other funny color, um, which I can best describe as an off shade of red, um, is the worst case drought of the pool. Um, so the difference between the two then shows the cost, the cost efficiency. Um, 
And, and, and this is a slide that um, people in the insurance industry are more familiar with. I mean, this is what you need to know in order for you to ensure that you, that you cover your bread and butter issues. And it essentially shows, shows that um, what the pool does is that it lowers the covariance um, of a, a, a pooled group of, of countries. So when you take um, each of these individual countries, looking at the aver annual average loss and, and the standard deviation that is calculated for each of these countries, what we do see is that the covariance of the portfolio drops from 2.63 to 1.447. Um, I mean, th this is something that, that, that a person in the insurance industry and, and something that Debbie is going to be a lot more familiar with than, 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 what, than what I am. Um, and, and then depending on um, the period of the coverage that you're going to be taking out, whether it's a one to five year retention, a one to seven year retention, or one to 10 year retention, in the case of a one, year one to 10 year retention, the market savings for the group of countries that are shown here is up to 52% 50, 52 savings. And I mean, this is not um, um, uh, just, uh, snake oil that I'm selling to you. I mean, this is, um, you know, any honest insurance broker is going to be able to present this with, to, to you with, with a great deal of credibility. Um, so, once again, some of the principles that have already been touched on is, is the benefits of contingency funds, immediate liquidity, um, lowers the cost of intervention, and also improves um, the whole system of financial and, 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 budgetary, and budgetary management. Um, how is the, the risk quantified? Um, Firstly, the, the hazard is determined by um, using a satellite-based satellite rainfall data, and we will look at the software in the next slide. Um, the vulnerability is essentially asking the question, who is at risk, where are they, what are, the, um, what are they growing, or where do their herds grade, graze? Um, and then also, it examines the exposure in today's procurement and logistics costs, how much will it cost to assist, assist each potential person that is affected by, by the drought. Um, the, the technical software that is used is called African Risk View, um, and it looks at rainfall, it looks at the drought index, the populations affected, and also, and also the cost. And then you can see the, the second window on, on, on my right, your left, um, then shows the, the satellite imagery and, and also some of the screens that provide um, the outcome. So this is essentially the, 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 the software and, and what, what is referred to as the technical engine that the African risk capacity will be using. Um, there are two members in, 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 the, in the audience here um, that work full-time for the African risk capacity and, and I'm sure that if there are more technical questions um, that are posed that I'm not going to be able to answer, um, they, they, they will be more than happy to provide the explanation on that. Um, so the African risk capacity, and I'm told to stop, I think that this is well known and, and, and well covered by previous presenta presenters and also something that I've touched on um, um, in, in previous slides. So it's essentially a, a facility that is going to take a series of um, ex-ante measures in order to have um, a, 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 a response that is developed before the event takes place. Um, I'm not going to go through this, um, but what this basically shows is that there is an African Union um, level mandate for this. It's a discussion that has largely been undertaken by African finance ministers and also those ministers that are responsible for disaster risk reduction. And the facility now, because there's a resolution that's been taken by African finance ministers, this proposal will go to, to African heads of state when they meet the next time in, in Addis. Um, this just sets out some of the steps that we are taking moving forward. Um, about 18 missions have been conducted. 
um, meaning 18 countries that have been visited. Um, South Africa is not a country that has been visited, um, so we're still planning that workshop to, to take place with um, the people involved in this business in South Africa. Technical workshops have been undertaken, um, and at least six pre-participation agreements have already been, already been concluded. The goal is to raise 200 million US. Um, there are initial um, commitments of capital of 90 million. Um, in terms of the institution that will be established, um, as we said, this is a decision of the AU Summit. Um, a meeting of government experts has taken place. Um, there's been a validation workshop in terms of how these things work. Sometimes, you know, you get bogged down by multilateral bureaucracy, um, but, 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 but sometimes it, it is good to follow those procedures. Um, um, the, the next step would be a meeting of, of plenipotentiaries. Um, I'm, I'm still not too sure who that grouping of people are. I, I'm told they kind of represent the heads of state. Um, and then we have a conference of parties um, that will look at the incorporation of um, the ARC as a specialized agency of the African Union, which will then incorporate a fund, um, which will be the insurance fund um, that will be operated. Um, there are some additional slides. I'm sure this is going to be posted on the website or handed out, which you can, which you can further examine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil. There's always a tendency not to really impose on the people that hold the purse, because ultimately at some point in time I have to go back to them and ask for money. And he will remind me that the day that we told him to stop while he was so eloquently presenting his presentation. Neil, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a, a, a question and answer session. Um, and, and any issues that anybody wants to raise that they think that could support some of the presentations that we do have. We have about 15 minutes to deal with this. And um, we'll see how we take the process forward from there. Can we ask the panelists to come and join us up here so that they are closest to the microphones, so that they can deal with all the difficult questions they're going to be asked? So, so what I will suggest is that we take um, a series of uh, three, four questions to start, and then we're going to ask our panelists to, to answer them. Again, uh, feel free to be candid, provocative. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the, the purpose of this session is really to not only to uh, to complement what was presented, but also through the presentations to trigger additional uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, or comments from, uh, from, from the floor. So who wants to, uh, wants to start? I don't know if we have a mic in the... Uh no, I think we have a mic. It will be easier because I think the, the session is recorded. So if you could Hello. briefly introduce yourself and ask a kind of quick and short question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sarshan Marie. I'm representing Conservation South Africa, an affiliate of Conservation International. Um, thank you very much to all of the speakers. I just yeah, wanted to comment really on um, the fact that I'm in, in, in very... Um, encouraged by the fact that there's a lot of uh, mention about uh, preventative measures and, and thinking about acting before the disaster. Um, what I wanted to ask specifically, um, possibly to Treasury, or actually if anyone wants to respond, in terms of the funding that's going into that preventative response, how much is focusing in terms of looking at our ecosystems and supporting developing ecological infrastructure? Thank you. Another question we can uh, we can take, please. The mic has to come. Thank you very much, Mami Razakanev from uh, Madagascar, uh, director of the implementation of Shrak Two. Uh, the assurance mechanism is very uh, it's new new aspect in the Afri in Africa mm, and uh, in order to understand very well it uh, we need to have many uh, sensibilization and uh, good information for the country in the in the, in the, the, the um, organization and uh, uh, the government in Africa uh, I have uh, one question with the Swiss uh, cooperation 
I uh, how is the, uh, how to 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 have the um, that the uh, how to 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 to, uh, to su support the country to have the the risk profile and the assessment and uh, I don't know if you can support the country to because I, uh, it is important to put uh, the contra contingency fund first and after we can go with the insurance and uh, different uh, country bond and so on. Thank you very much. Very good point. Uh, f further question? Uh, maybe a third one before we, uh, we ask our panelists to answer. Good morning. I am Sanjay Agrawal from India. I just want to know how the reinsurance is effective in disaster risk financing. Can you throw some light on that, on the reinsurance? Thank you. Oh, sorry, what do you mean by uh, reinsurance being effective? What's, uh, yeah, can you actually elaborate? In, uh, in one of the presentation, reinsurance was uh, uh, told okay. that uh, it is part of the disaster risk financing. Okay. So I just want to know how it, is, it will be effective for the risk financing. Okay, thank you. Good, let's start answering the question. So the first one about the uh, preventive uh, uh, management and the impact on ecosystem, maybe from uh, Treasury of South Africa, what's your experience on that? Thank you. Um, I suppose I'm going to have to um, provide a very unfair response to, to the question and, and, and say that um, you know, every second year there's an open budget index that is, that is undertaken by the International Budget um, Partnership and, and for the 2010 Open Budget Index, South Africa scored number one. So we have the most open budget. Um, we, we beat um, the US into second place. We beat um, um, the UK into third place. Um, so if you, if, you, if you take a South African budget document, you should be able to find out what we spend um, on, on government programs. So I'm not going to be able to, 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 to provide you with, with that answer. Um, I, I, I don't work in the budget office, so it, it, it's not a, a, a figure or, or a program that I'm going to be able to rattle off um, because I'm, I'm not that familiar with um, how and, and what programs allocations are, are made on. Um, I, I work in the International Economic Policy Division of the Treasury. But let me assure you, um, 2008, we came second. In 2010, we, we, we took first, first spot as the most open, or oh, having the most open budget. Um, so I'm at, what I do volunteer to do is to, is to sit with you after the session. We go through the budget documents, and I'm sure we will quite easily be able to ascertain whether the South African government is, is providing I I enough funds um, for the kind of measures that, you, that, that, that I certainly believe are important um, for, government, for, for governments to allocate the money um, for. Thanks. Okay, Neil. Uh, Manuel, do you have any, any uh, further comments on the Mexican experience on that in, in a few words? Um, and then, then there is a concern again. Uh, there, there are preventing uh, uh, me measures uh, that we've been taking. Particularly, we we cover a zone in uh, Yucatan where Cancun probably where Cancun is. Per, but I think that I should use this word Cancun, and um, uh, that, that there is a very uh, biodiversified zone. Uh, but again, these are financial protections. You know, you, uh, and I, I just want to say that. Okay, thank you, Manuel. A second question from the gentleman from uh, Madagascar to uh, Marcus on uh, the uh, the need for additional, I would say, exposure and uh, uh, capacity building on uh, risk assessment and risk financing. What uh, Seco and other donors are doing? Yes, thanks. Sorry, how do I? It's on. Okay. Do you hear me? Because well, I don't hear if you hear me. <laughs> Um, indeed, it's a very valid and very relevant question. That is actually why we started this endeavor. Um, we've partnered up with the World Bank exactly on that and go on, went into a, a partnership on financial risk management. Um, what we're doing in there, what the, what the uh, portfolio of activities entails, is indeed 
to start with the catastrophe risk modeling. So you first, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm going to reiterate actually what you have seen in all the presentations and just put it together comprehensively. Um, you first need to know where your risk is. So you first start with your modeling. Then you assess the economic and fiscal impact of that risk. In this case, the natural disaster. Um, you'll have a re review of your ma fiscal management of natural disaster, disasters. So you, you basically match that with what you have at hand already and what, um, what the um, possibilities could be. Um, you'll have a look whether you have a catastrophic ins insurance regulator framework at hand in the country um, in order to manage that. If you haven't, probably that would be a way to go and look into it, what you could do better there. And finally, you do a capacity transfer and training on sovereign di disaster risk financing strategies so that if you haven't, after that program, you're incapacitated and you can do go down further the line and, and for the next one, be, pre be prepared and do it on your own. Probably I just end, uh, put on here like what, what reinsurance companies can do in that. As I said before, um, if you don't get um, a private mechanism, financing mechanism involved, the, the country well, basically Treasury at the very end, um, will ask, uh, act as a reinsurer of last resort anyway. So the question is, are you able, with a diversified set of mechanisms, to reinsure at least a part of these risks with private reinsurance companies in order to be covered? I mean, um, probably in, so in, in, in Southern Africa it's less obvious than in the Indian or, 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 or Asian Pacific example where, where, where the tsunami, I think, um, gave the best example um, that you can have a risk uh, which is rather high, um, which you want to, where you want to see uh, what you're going to do with because basically if it hits you, it is detrimental to the country and you can't help yourself out on your own. And that is exactly where we see the role of, 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 of the private market as well, of risk reinsurance companies who can cover at least a part of that. Fair enough to say is not they can't cover, cover everything and you probably as a country wouldn't like a reinsurance company to cover everything because your premiums, as our uh, Malawian colleague uh, said, will also then be questioned in parliament. Um, and you need to find the right balance, and you f need to find the right mix, which is also um, uh, corresponding to, to your capaci capabilities as a country and as, an, as a treasury there. Thank you, Marcus. Just to elaborate a bit on that, I'd also like to, uh, to highlight what you said in your question, the importance of combining instruments, and uh, the importance of a kind of proper financial risk profile to identify the range instruments between contingency planning, uh, between budgets, contingency credit to some extent, and ultimately, for the top layers, uh, for the top layers insurance. And as you may know, in Madagascar, for example, the global facility for disaster reduction and recovery is already active on, uh, on disaster risk management and uh, on, on disaster risk financing. Uh, the third question before we go through the next uh, round of questions was about, uh, from our colleague from uh, India, about the uh, reinsurance and how effective is reinsurance. I guess, Manuel, you can uh, share your experience, your recent experience uh, with the fund. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Um, yes, I think that the reinsurers are, are affected in, in, in several sense. At least two on the top of, the mi of my mind is that they, uh, they provide um, technical assistance to develop a risk um, a financing strategy. And also they help us to build the, the models that Marcus was referring to. We have a model in Mexico and they have other models that they provide and together with these models can give you a better, excuse me, a better assessment of the risk. Also, in that technical part, the World Bank has been uh, partnering with Mexico and has been very important in that. Um, on, the second, on the second part, uh, at least in the first losses insurance, uh, reinsu international insurance has been very active, uh, providing funding uh, to, to local insurance. And uh, we have, a, um, the, the Mexican government has a partnership with them, the two main uh, reinsurers, and they, in case of a disaster, they're going to provide with the funds. Let me tell you that um, in 2010, there was an important earthquake in, a, in the northern part in Mexico, in, in, Calif in, in Baja, California, what they, what they call Baja. Um, there was a, um, an estimated losses um, for, for the government of around uh, 100, uh, 100 million dollars and the insurance pay, paid a very important part of it. So, so the insurance are effective at least in, in these uh, two ways. Thank you, Olivia. 
Okay, thank you. Again, just to elaborate on that, the way we also have been interacting with the reinsurance market is at two level. First of all, as you know, the reinsurance market will provide reinsurance capacity, financial capacity, but we should not also underestimate their technical expertise to help countries ultimately and insurance companies to design uh, proper, proper solutions. Uh, we still have some, a few minutes before we ask uh, um, um, uh, Anthony Julius to give his uh, closing remarks, so maybe we can take um, a second set of uh, questions. Madam? Good morning, my name is Marty Weripo. I run an NGO uh, involved in disaster distress relief. My question would be, in the case of insurance, how would you roll this down to the lowest level of uh, funding in the South African government, down to your municipal, local municipal level? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Fatou Yang from the African Risk Capacity. I'd be very interested in the experience of Malawi because we are eager while we're building the, the ARC to learn from probably um, your experience and uh, your potential improvements to your Maze Index facility. Um, I would like to know what type of contingency plans do you have in place uh, related to your insurance contract, um, your put option contract, and then um, why do you feel that you have to improve on the index? As in, is there a discrepancy between what you're seeing in, on the ground versus what your, your meteo stations are recording? And also, what are the improvements that the Malawi government is suggesting at, the, at this time um, to, um, to improve the, the, their uh, risk financing solution? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, friends. My name is Tebo Hohaulaului. I'm coming from the PDMC Limpopo province. I had two questions that I want to ask, but fortunately, uh, the lady just asked the one on the rollout uh, based on the insurance in order to go down into the municipalities, your local municipalities. The question that I would like um, to get is that um, we are talking about the paradigm shift where we are going away from spending too much money on response but rather to come with educational programs in order to minimize the risk that we are facing. Now the very question that I would like to know um, is to take that one of the in NDMC having collaborated with the business in order to make sure that we engage in the insurance. But one of the most important questions, and we know that we, we cannot uh, predict the weather, is the question to ask that, what is the target date? Uh, because the problem is that uh, too much money is lost in response and recovery. Uh, taking with the insurance, saying that we put on the insurance in order to, um, not actually to pause the risk, but in order to minimize the risk. What is the target date for South Africa to collaborate with business? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Philip Boulet. I'm from the Islands Project of the Indian Ocean Commission. Um, I, I was very much impressed by all that was said, but um, we've been talking about risks like flood, like uh, drought. What about new risks or, well, let's say risks that are coming, like coastal floods, like damage to infrastructures around coasts, uh, like damage to what is sometimes called tourism infrastructure? Is there a possibility of going into that or is it too early to start thinking about it? Okay, last question maybe. Good morning. I'm from the UNISDR Regional Office for Africa. I have a question about the ARC. And uh, my question is obviously in, in DRR we're trying to find long-term solutions and long-term change. So is there a provision that, um, for example, the contingency plans that you base um, the, the payouts on, that there any sort of long-term solutions that should be also um, addressed by the payouts? Or is it simply let's say food aid and getting back to, to the normal situation. Thank you. Okay, good. Let's try to group a bit the questions. Um, let's start with the first um, question about the insurance at the uh, sub-Saharan level, municipal level. 
Um, I'd like to invite maybe, why don't you start Manuel, because you have some experience in Mexico, and maybe then we can ask uh, uh, Neil to comment from, uh, from South Africa. Um, yes, uh, the, the federal government has some experience transferring, uh, transferring uh, natural hazard risk uh, to the financial markets, international financial markets, and, and this experience have been sharing with the, with the state governments, not at the, exactly at the municipal uh, level yet, but that, but that is the expansion plan. And, and also uh, with the World Bank recently been working on a facility. You know, Mexico is a large country as is South Africa. So there are um, about pooling risk. There are, there are potential uh, for pooling risk in, in some states of Mexico, and this is at the local level, and this is going to be very helpful for them uh, to, to pull the risk, the natural uh, hazards, and, um, and to transfer them to the, to, the financial, to the financial markets. I think this is very important, and I think that we need to build um, a, more, uh, um, a better prepared society at that level. Thank you. Neil, quickly on, on uh, thank this you very, very much, Olivia. I mean, there, there are, I suppose, many people in, in the room that um, are more familiar with how things um, or how the response works currently. Um, what, what we are saying with ARC is that um, there'd be a much faster disbursement of, of funds. Um, the mere fact that, that, that this facility is, is a country-owned or African-owned facility means that the decisions that are going to be taken on how the funds that are made available are going to be programmed will reside with the government. Um, I mean, if you think of the South African experience, I mean, there's obviously legislation that one needs to take into, into account, um, in particular, Public Financial Management Act, um, and probably more importantly, the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Act, which is going to determine which sphere of government um, needs to take responsibility to, um, to respond to the event that, 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 has, that has taken place. Um, at, I mean, many of you will be familiar that in South Africa we have national government, provincial and, and local government. Um, some of the functions are um, accorded to the specific sphere. Other functions are concurrent functions. Um, so we have a, a, a national disaster management center. One would imagine that um, a disbursement out of ARC would work very similarly, similarly to the way that if money is made available to respond to a disaster, how um, the, the, our, our department um, of corporate governance and um, our nas national um, disaster management center is going to program that money um, would be very similar to the way that it is, it, it is currently programmed as, 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 as part of a, a, a normal public financial management. Um, but, uh, I, I, but just to say that I, I, I think it's, very, it's a very important question because um, the idea here is that you, you do want this facility to provide faster disbursement, and it's not just faster disbursement to the revenue fund of a country, um, you want faster disbursement from the revenue fund of that country to the municipalities or the people that have been affected by, 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 by the disaster. And, and, and it's certainly, um, you know, as a, as a member country of the African Union, it is certainly something that South Africa would want to see the, the ARC being able to provide for, and that is that fast disbursement of the money um, once the country receives it um, to those that are most affected by, 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 by the disaster. Um, can, can I just um, come, come back to, to, to an earlier question on, on, on the reinsurance and also just say that, I mean, there are, there are several models that are being tested um, for ARC. Um, what, what I said was that, um, that there's a transfer from governments um, to the ARC. There's also a, a risk level that would result in a transfer of the risk from ARC to, to, to reinsurance companies. There are several companies that, that, that ARC is working with, Swiss Re, Munich Re, and others. Um, and, and, and the model that, that ARC is looking at is, is very similar to the Caribbean Risk Facility um, in terms of, of, of a reinsurance facility for, 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 for the ARC. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Daisy, maybe some comments on, um, on the um, contingency plan developed by the government of Malawi, if there is one. Uh, <coughs> Uh, thank you. 
and uh, thanks to the colleague from ARC. Indeed, uh, in Malawi we have some plans. Uh, within the budget, there is a vote on uh, unforeseen circumstances, but when a disaster strikes, the usual problems of accessing those resources, timely, it's, it remains an issue. But uh, nice to say that uh, due to the political will on the part of the government, I think the number of uh, frameworks, policy frameworks being developed, trying to put bits and pieces together so that uh, we are well positioned to tackle issues of disaster, including agricultural risk, which, which I'm passionate about. And uh, uh, I think uh, on the adjustments that we are making uh, in view of the initiative by Af uh, is it WFP, the, the Africa Risk Capacity? African Union, okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, as I said uh, during my presentation, we are actually like at a crossroads where we are rethinking our position to say which way do we go? We have these different alternatives or approaches that we can use. Uh, one of which uh, that we are considering is going the Africa Risk Capacity way. And to that effect, uh, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, you may want to hear that we had a, a mission from Africa Risk Capacity. We have been interacting with them. Currently, we are reviewing an MOU, which uh, is supposed to govern the process. We want to, to look at it critically so that we, we are not in, in the same vein where we, we want to understand it properly and make sure that the recommendations we make to government are well informed. So we are very much into it, and I think uh, the policymakers know about this. Yeah, so one of the alternatives is Africa risk capacity, and we, the probability is very high that we might, ad we might go that way as well, or in addition to the other <laughs> approaches that are in place. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Desi, I'm afraid we're running out of time, and uh, I would like now to invite um, um, Anthony Julie, who is uh, Chief Director of Strategy and Risk Management, National Treasury from the Government of South Africa, to give uh, his uh, closing remarks to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. Uh, it's uh, been a useful uh, discussion. Um, considering also that uh, we've had you come from the World Bank a day before uh, Independence Day, so you'll be celebrating your Independence Day here in the southern tip uh, of Africa. Uh, so, um, this is certainly a very important uh, topic, uh, discussion. Um, there's so much talk these days uh, about developments in the Eurozone. I've just returned from an IMF discussion around um, just trying to keep the, the Euro intact. And here we have uh, the Swiss government talking about supporting uh, financing disaster relief. Um, so, so I think that just talks to the, the significance of this topic. Disasters uh, certainly is, is a major threat uh, to developing countries, to emerging markets in particular. Um, we, we've not had the situation in emerging markets in particular that developed and advanced economies have had uh, as a result of the crisis that has um, erupted in, in the advanced economies. Uh, we, our stimulus package, uh, packages in, in the emerging markets have indeed been uh, infrastructure spending. In particular in South Africa, we've spent significant amounts on infrastructure uh, and strategic infrastructure uh, for that matter, um, both as government as well as, as our state-owned entities. Um, over the medium term, uh, the medium-term expenditure framework, that's a three-year period, we're planning to spend over $100 billion, okay, over 844 billion rands on public infrastructure. Over the period to 2020, uh, as, as government and as the public sector, we're planning to spend over $400 billion, U.S. dollars, over 3.2 trillion rand on infrastructure, strategic infrastructure. 
In addition to all the spending and infrastructure as government that we are planning to do over this period, we also have in South Africa, and I'm sure in many advanced and emerging economies, uh, in developing economies and emerging economies, we have social challenges, enormous social challenges. We have a national development plan uh, that we are implementing that seeks to create jobs, where in the past we've not really created jobs. We've had some growth, but we've not created jobs. We have a very high unemployment of 25% in South Africa. We are expanding infrastructure, where we've seen infrastructure, the lack of spending in infrastructure has, has led to infrastructure crumbling. We've, uh, we are also building a capable state uh, where we know public service in areas have become inefficient and uneven. We are fighting corruption where we know how widespread it is, both in the private and in the public sectors. Uh, we are providing quality education and health care, uh, knowing that we have very poor quality of education. And uh, the burden of disease is indeed very high. And we are also uh, looking at inclusive planning uh, rather than the exclusive planning. And therefore, considering all of these challenges and the significant investments that we are making, and a development plan that we are implementing. It is important that we cannot, as government, uh, put these, pl these plans at risk uh, by not really understanding uh, the implications um, of uh, natural disasters and what it can mean and how it, in fact, can derail our plans. And therefore, it becomes necessary that we understand and that we use information and management systems. And that is key, really, uh, to devise cost-effective uh, and time-efficient uh, disaster risk financing and insurance solutions. Um, this really implies that every country must understand its own exposure, and this is key. You need to understand, as a country, your exposure to natural disasters. This is a prerequisite, really, to developing financial protection strategies and conducting cost-benefit analysis of investments and, and risk mitigation. Uh, and this is also a prerequisite, this understanding of your natural disasters is also a prerequisite for really effectively being able to transfer catastrophic risk uh, to the private sector. Now, when you talk about financing uh, disaster recovery, uh, there are two streams of financing um, in the event of a, of a disaster, and, and, it's, and it's been referred to by the speakers, it's necessary to find this optimal mix between these two streams. Uh, of financing. The one is a short, immediate response uh, to a recovery. And, uh, and that is really to, to ensure that, they are, they, that all the negative effects are minimized and that service delivery uh, is not compromised. And these, these instruments are essentially ex ante instruments. These are instruments that are available before uh, the event of a disaster. Um, and they cater uh, caters for immediate injection. And then you have uh, a longer-term response, and the longer-term response uh, really looks at um, the rehabilitation of, of infrastructure, uh, medium to longer-term uh, intervention. And this is essentially funded through the budget um, or other adjustments uh, in the budget. But it's also in this area, in the longer-term type of response, that a partnership with the private sector uh, is useful because you can imagine when it comes to a, a catastrophic uh, event, the cost uh, will certainly be very high, and uh, the, the, the fiscal, the fiscus, the budget, would certainly not be sufficient uh, to bear those costs. Now, given the, the magnitude um, of these resources that are required uh, in, the, in the event of a disaster, we need to draw on experiences, and I think what we've uh, had the discussion we've had this morning is really drawing on experiences um, of people who have expertise in this area and countries who have expertise in this area. Uh, and really the objective of drawing on existing expertise and experience is really to increase the speed with, the, with which the state can respond and also increasing the financial response capacity uh, while at the same time as a state uh, you are reducing the financial vulnerability of the state to natural disasters. Now, two things are important when it comes to natural disaster because it is a contingent liability, and when you deal with contingent liabilities, you need to know one. You need to know the size of the contingent liability, and that is uh, an exercise on its own. 
um, and therefore you need the expertise in order to assist in that area uh, to determine the loss potential. And the second important point when dealing with a contingent liability like a natural disaster is uh, to know the likelihood and the probability of a natural disaster. Uh, now, I'm just going to conclude, and I think coming from the National Treasury, we can't you know, be st standing and talking without making reference to numbers, and I have already made reference to numbers, and I am uh, Neil would attest to that, a good public servant. So uh, coming from the Treasury, we need to just talk about some numbers. Uh, in government, we have made available, uh, uh, and I'm not suggesting that these amounts are at all, you know, sufficient to deal with uh, disasters that might hit South Africa. Uh, but there are two grants, specific grants that are made available, and this is recent grants that have been introduced, one a provincial disaster grant as well as a municipal disaster grant, and this is on budget, um, and over the medium term an amount of 1.6 billion rand uh, is available or has been made available for both the provinces and, and municipalities. We have, and we know we don't, uh, this is not dedicated to disasters, but we have on budget a contingency financing and it's not always good to talk about this contingency financing when the labor unions are aware that there's a contingency financing. So when it comes to labor wage negotiations, the public sector, they always look at what amount is available in addition to what has been provided uh, for wage increases. But there's a contingency financing on budget as well um, of 42 billion over the medium term that can be utilized for disasters. And certainly we have, as all countries, uh, we have built up reserves, official reserves, in the event of real disasters, and we have about $50 billion uh, amount in our official reserves um, to face whatever uh, uh, contingency uh, crisis situation we might find ourselves in. Um, so with that numbers note, I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your presence, uh, and I'm sure that those of you that attended the Ignite session last night, uh, the impact that Laura had is visible here today. Thank you very much, Laura. You had a full house for us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, tea served on the, lo the, on the ground floor before the next session starts. Thank you very much for all your participation and for the presenters. <laughs>